Welcome back. We're on lesson 13. Um, we're going to start the life of Joseph, and next week, lesson 14, will be the last lesson of the study where we finish um, talking about the life of Joseph. And so uh, today we're going over Joseph's humiliation and his exaltation. And so we've got um, the beginning of his story where um, we talk about um, what led to Joseph being uh, in Egypt and the start of his stay in Egypt. So if you um, will go to chapter 37 in your Bible and read chapter 37, um, then we will come back and discuss um, what's going on here. <clears throat> So as you've read chapter 37, you see that um, Joseph is 17 years old when this story starts. Now, remember, Jacob uh, slash Israel has taken over um, his father's uh, job and role and mission and is living in the land of Canaan. He, is, uh, he has lots of herds and flocks, and he's very powerful. He is Abraham's grandson. And he has uh, a lot of kids. He has 12 sons. And the uh, son that he is the closest with is Joseph. And Joseph is uh, uh, from his favorite wife, Rachel. And, uh, you know, he just, it's, it's a lot like the story of Isaac with Jacob and Esau, where you have a favorite son for one and a favorite son for the other. Well, uh, here we have Joseph, the favorite son of Jacob slash Israel. So son from the favorite wife, Rachel, and also he has a special coat or a coat of many colors is what it's translated oftentimes. Um, sometimes, you know, we talk about that's what the Latin and the Vulgate and the Septuagint uh, kind of translated it. Some uh Translations talk about a coat with long sleeves. It was just a special glittery coat. Uh, some of the Hebrew scholars think that maybe it had some gold thread in it, so it was really shiny from a distance. And we don't know um, exactly what it was, but we know that it was a status symbol of being this special son. And also, um, he is staying at home, which does remind us of Jacob a lot, because remember, he was a man who uh, was a diplomatic tent dwelling administrator type of guy and uh, it seems that Joseph is kind of staying around the house while the rest of the brothers are out under the hot sun uh, you know making the flocks move properly and so this starts um, you know pretty bad um, there's it's it's ripe for conflict and so we see um, in verse four of chapter 37, but when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. So there's not a good relationship in the family uh, with Joseph. But furthermore, we read about dreams that he had. He has these dreams where he is over the rest of his brothers and even over his father and it gets so bad that um jacob even says to him shall i and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground for you even he knows this has gotten out of hand so we uh we kind of see that there are some weird things going on with this family relationship and uh but God's moving behind the scenes to do something. And so the second section in chapter 37 is uh, that we see um, not only has he um, got an exalted status over his brothers in his mind, but it turns their relationship so sour that they have a little plan. So uh, in verse 13, 12, his brothers are pasturing their flocks near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, um, are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. So he probably has some food and some provisions for them. And what's going to happen is he's going to, Joseph's going to deliver this food to them. And this is very similar to the story where David is at home watching the flocks 
and his brothers are off fighting the Philistines, and the father, Jesse, sends David to carry food to his brothers. And so he's probably making a bit of a, of a supply delivery here. And uh, what's, what's interesting is he, he doesn't find his brothers where they're supposed to be. They've moved on. And so he goes to the second place, Dothan. And uh, as he goes there, um, they see him. And I guess it's because he's wearing that shiny uh, coat we talked about. Might have had some gold thread that the light reflected off of. So they might see him from a distance and they think to themselves, he's wearing that ridiculous coat. Um, he, you know, here he comes. Uh, and so they kind of get this plan. Verse 20 says, come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. And the pits here are uh, cisterns. And so in this uh, area of the world, you would dig a big pit into the rock or into the soil, which was very hard soil. And you would use it to catch rainwater. And as it caught rainwater, it would be used as a well during dry season. But as it dried up, it would be filled with caked, nasty mud. And so they're wanting to throw him in one of these cisterns. And uh, then they're going to say that uh, a fierce animal has devoured him and we will see what will become of his dreams. So they are so angry, they want to kill him. That's how bad the relationship has deteriorated. But verse 21, Reuben, the firstborn, when he heard it, uh, this is interesting about Reuben, Reuben's character and his feelings towards his father. Um, when Reuben heard it, he rescued him out of their hands, saying, let us not take his life. And Reuben said to them, shed no blood, cast him into this uh, pit here in the wilderness. Do not lay a hand on him. Because he was going to rescue him out of their hand to restore him, or it says that he might rescue him out of their hand to restore him to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the robe of many colors that he wore, and they took him and cast him into a pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. So Reuben um, doesn't want Jacob to uh, suffer at the death of one of his sons, he's going to rescue him. So they sat down, then they sat down to eat, verse 25, and looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites, some of their cousins, coming from Gilead with their camels bearing gum, balm, and myrrh on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Now these words in Hebrew talk about different ointments that were used um, to heal skin diseases, to heal different pain thing. I mean, you know, this was uh, ancient form of medicine was to make balm out of these uh, trees and out of sap. And Gilead was famous for it. And so this caravan's coming up carrying medicine and ointments and stuff to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, what profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and let not our hand be upon him for he is our brother our own flesh, and his brothers listened to him. Uh, then Midianite, Midianite traders passed by, and they drew Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites, 20 shekels of silver. They took Joseph to Egypt. So Judah thinks, let's make some money off this. And he ends up um, selling his brother. You know, the, the, the brothers don't come off with the best character from the story. Um, and there's another story, um, you know, there are other stories in this section of Genesis that just show that uh, these, these brothers can be wild. Um, they can be really rough around the edges. And, uh, and so they're, you know, selling their brother into slavery. Um, so just a real quick thing. Uh, the amount of money they got for him was in line with what, um, what, uh, people would get at the time for someone this age, a slave of this age. It wasn't a lot. Um, we think of 20 shekels of silver, but a shepherd would only make about eight shekels a year um, shepherding. So, you know, it was a better, um, a better uh, chunk of money than they would get at a short amount of time um, just to sell their brother. So we've got this, uh, this, story here where Joseph is now sold into slavery, but 
Reuben comes back. Reuben was not there. And when he returns, he gets angry. And uh, you look in verse 30, and returned to his brothers and said, the boy is gone and I, where shall I go? And they took Joseph's robe and slaughtered a goat, and dipped the robe in the blood, and they sent the robe of many colors and brought it to their father and said, this we have found. Please identify whether it is your son's robe or not. And Jacob is distraught. I mean, he says basically he will mourn um, until he dies. He is not going to uh, stop mourning. Um, usually you'd mourn for a week or two weeks. But he says, I'm not going to stop mourning. Um, I shall go down to Sheol to my son mourning. He says, I'll never be over this. And uh, it says that Joseph will get sold in Egypt to a guy named Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard. And so you see the deception of the brothers. They won't even go themselves to announce what they found. They send a servant, it seems, to take this robe. and. Uh, and Joseph, though we, though Jacob does not know it, he is uh, safe in Egypt, working for um, a captain of the guard. It seems that this guy is in charge of prison guards, and so he uh, manages. It's kind of like he manages the uh, law enforcement that handle prisons. And so we've uh, we've got to the first part of the story here, where Joseph, uh, we call it his humiliation. Um, he is humiliated by no longer being the treasured son of his father, living with his father, but now he is a slave in Egypt, and his father thinks he's dead. So let's go to chapter 39. Now we're going to skip chapter 38, which is, which is an interesting story about Judah, um, but we're going to read chapter 39 because uh, the story with Judah um, does not, um, even though it's part of the story of Israel, um, it's not dealing with Joseph's life per se. And so we're going to go to chapter 39, and then uh, I want you to read uh, chapter 39, and then we're going to come back and discuss it. Well, you've read chapter 39, and um, what we're going to look at now is um, Joseph's exaltation this is his humiliation came first and now we're looking at his exaltation and it's going to happen through a little bit more humiliation but we we see that in chapter 39 that joseph is really good at managing a business and an estate is probably what he's been trained to do by his father remember when i said the lesson on jacob it said that jacob um dwelt in tents and i said that this meant he was a perfect man in hebrew or a complete man it meant he was diplomatic he could manage the house economy he could manage the shepherd economy it wasn't that he was out in the fields you know dealing with the animals directly but he knew how to handle the business side of everything it seems that joseph has the same gift and so um in verse 3, his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight, that's Potiphar's sight, and attended him. And he made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. And so you just look at this and the guy is an administrative genius. God has blessed him in this way and is with him. And uh, he, he leaves all that he has in Joseph's charge. And it says in verse 6, because of him, he had no concern about anything but the food he ate. So Potiphar's stress level is basically, do I want, uh, you know, this food or this wonderful food today? Because I don't have any other decisions. My uh, slave Joseph handles everything. You know, slavery in the ancient world was different than um, what we think about 19th, 17th, 18th, and 19th century American slavery, which we call chattel slavery, um, which was race-based. And, and based on, uh, you know, systematic oppression of a certain race. In the ancient world, uh, slavery was an economic thing. Now, there were races that were enslaved after wars where you just said, hey, like the Romans, we don't like the Carthaginians anymore. Anyone from Carthage, we're going to sell you into slavery because we can't trust you. So there were times that it was, it was based on ethnicity or a, or a group or an identity. Um, but also slavery in the ancient world 
you might be uh, a prince. Uh, you might be a royal official, and if you got on the wrong side of somebody, you would get sold into slavery. If you ran up debts that you could not repay, you would be sold into slavery. You might be working in a field, or you might be the accountant of some rich guy, and both were slaves. In the Roman world, they liked tutors to be slaves in their house. So basically, if you work for the public education system today, you might have been a slave in the ancient world. A house would employ you. They would pay for you. They would meet all your needs. They might even marry you off to a family member if you did a really good job of teaching. And uh, this was just the way that economics worked in a world where there's no social safety net. Um, oftentimes, slavery would be, you know, a form of welfare. And so we are glad that we don't live in that type of world. Um, but Joseph is a slave. And he's a slave that's so powerful, he manages uh, the entire household economy of the chief of the prison guards for Pharaoh. So he's, uh, he's moved up in the world, but we see there's trouble because in the end of verse 6, we find out Joseph has something working against him. And that's he's handsome in form and appearance. And so... The same thing, I believe, is said about Rachel, his mother. Um, he just, he looks good. He's got symmetry and proportion that makes him look like an attractive young man. Um, he is now in his late teens or early 20s. Um, and after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, lie with me. So the master's wife is beginning to think immoral, lustful thoughts about Joseph, and she's trying to proposition him to do something immoral and evil. And it's interesting because if you do read this section of Genesis, the sons of Israel do not come off as positive men. Uh, the other 11 sons tried to sell Joseph into slavery after deciding not to kill him. Um, and then if you know, you look at chapter 38, uh, Judah. Um, frequent prostitutes. And so they don't come across as uh, good men. Also, in a story before this, um, back in chapter um, 34, one of the sisters of the sons of Leah is defiled by a local Canaanite guy living in the land. And two of the brothers end up wiping out an entire village of men, of Canaanites, in, in, in revenge because their sister was defiled by this man, kidnapped in his house. They were blackmailing Jacob to marry her. And because Jacob would not act, the brothers did and end up just exterminating an entire town. So the sons of Jacob, they don't come across as God-fearing, upright, uh, moral men. But if you look in chapter 39 here, Joseph is different. Even though he was cocky and even though he had a special outfit that he used to kind of make his brothers jealous at him, you look in verse 8. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house, and he has put everything that he has in my charge. He is not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except yourself, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? He really has a great moral framework here where he fears God, and he knows that the moral, uh, the moral issue of adultery is something he should not transgress. He should not do this, and he will not. But she doesn't get the hint. She continues her scheme and her plot to try and seduce this young man. And eventually, she grabs hold of his garment, and he has to flee and run because he can't be there. So as he flees and runs, says that his garment's left behind, and the wife now of Potiphar is, is scared. 
because she feels like, uh oh, there's evidence. So she moves first and she cries out to the servants and says, Look, look what happened. Look what this Hebrew uh, has done. And verse 17, she tells the same story to her master when he comes home, to her husband, the Hebrew servant whom you've brought among us, blaming him, came in to me to laugh at me. But as soon as I lifted up my voice and cried, he left his garment beside me and fled out of the house. So now she makes it sound like uh, Joseph came in to uh, try to violate her, to try to... Um, you know, basically do something immoral. He becomes the bad guy. And so he gets thrown, Joseph gets thrown in prison now. And uh, that basically he's not just sold into slavery, but now falsely accused. Now, what's interesting is we think that Potiphar might have known his wife was up to no good because in ancient Egypt, the penalty for someone who tried to rape a woman was the death penalty. And notice Joseph was thrown in prison. Now, remember, we said that Potiphar was the charge of prison, in charge of prison guards. But look, um, in verse 22, and the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. So not only is Joseph not killed or executed, he's in prison and he's in charge of prison. Uh, it seems to me that Potiphar might have said, listen, you know, Mr. Prison Guy, um, I'm putting a guy in here just because I can't, I can't have him run around my house with my wife accusing him, but I don't think he did anything bad. Uh, just keep him in prison. You know, he's a really great administrator. You might even want him to run the prison for you. He's a good guy, but I can't have him in my house because the servants think he tried to, you know, violate my wife and my wife's claiming it's my fault. Um, I think that Potiphar knew perhaps that his wife maybe was up to no good, but he powerful man and this guy's just a slave. What are you going to do? So chapter 39 ends and whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. So he is still um, working and having great success. Now I want you to pause and read chapter 40 and chapter um, 41. And we're going to sum up very quickly um, the exaltation of Joseph. Well, if you've read these two chapters, you see that Joseph's dreams um, earlier in the story come back. And now it seems that he interprets dreams. And he knows that God gives him the interpretation. He doesn't think it's magical power or anything like that. But he, uh, he gets some dreams in prison from a from a baker and a cupbearer, and he correctly interprets them. And the baker has his head cut off, and the cupbearer has his head lifted up as a play on words, meaning restored to his position, the Pharaoh. But as the Bible tells us, he did not remember that Joseph told him, I'm in here wrongly. Just let Pharaoh know I'm in here wrongly. He does not tell Pharaoh. He does not remember Joseph's plight in prison. And so as um, the story continues, and uh, after two whole years, at the beginning of chapter 41, after two whole years, Pharaoh dreamed he was standing by the Nile. And you've, from childhood, probably heard these Bible stories of seven fat cows and seven skinny cows, and uh, seven good ears of corn and seven shriveled up, rotten ears of corn. And Pharaoh is beside himself. He cannot interpret this dream. And all of a sudden, the cupbearer goes, hey, I, I remember something I was supposed to do two years ago. I was supposed to tell you about this young Hebrew. Well, he can interpret dreams. So Joseph is called for. Pharaoh tells him the dreams, and he interprets them. Seven years of plenty, seven years of famine. And he even has a an action plan for it. Let's store up 20% of the grain for seven years, which is, which is going to be, you know, because they are not just normal years, but years of great plenty is going to be just a hoard of grain that the nation can use for the seven lean years. 
And so they start this food program. They build storehouses. Joseph gets promoted over these, these public works, and he basically gets in charge of the agricultural economy of Egypt for seven years of plenty, and then they get ready for the seven years of famine. Remember from an earlier lesson, I told you that Egypt was the breadbasket of the Mediterranean. Even during Roman times, the Romans imported food from Egypt. The Romans imported food from North Africa. Um, it grew so much grain that in a normal year, they could trade it off. And in a plentiful year like this, keeping one fifth of it, they probably uh, ended up just having so much food just laying around stored that people, you know, go, whoa, what are we storing all this food for? So for seven years, by royal command, uh, Joseph keeps the economy tucking away 20% of their food. So after um, the seven years are up, the Bible says in verse 53, the seven years of chapter 41, the seven years of plenty that occurred in the land of Egypt came to an end and the seven years of famine began to come. There was famine in all the lands, but in all the land of Egypt there was bread. When all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians, go to Joseph. What he says to you, do. And in verse 57, the key here, this is where we're going to stop, and it goes perfectly into the next lesson, the last lesson. Moreover, all the earth came to Egypt to Joseph to buy grain because the famine was severe over all the earth. So all the ancient Middle East comes down to Egypt, trades with Egypt, wanting their food because there's been a famine and they didn't store up for it. So Joseph is second only to Pharaoh. He is uh, in charge of the entire economy. God has exalted him from being a little 17 year old, you know, teenager, uh, full of himself, to being a man who is saving an entire section of the world from famine. And we're going to uh, use this springboard next week to talk about how God preserves his promise to Abraham by using Joseph to save many people from famine. And so um, as you went through uh, this lesson, go back and think over what we're seeing, the transformation of Joseph, how he's being transformed through this whole process. Also think about his uprightness, his moral, um, his moral fiber compared to that of his brothers. It's interesting that his brothers, um, they're the ones who sold him into slavery. Um, and, and they exhibited such bad behavior, what's going to happen the next lesson when they meet Joseph? So uh, thank you for tuning in, and we'll see you next week. Um, hope you have a great one. Uh, God bless you and take care of you. Goodbye.